Ambitious is an understatement when you guys see what all I'm going to attempt to read. These are just the library books. I still have my boyfriend's TBR picks and two books that I pulled off of my shelves for myself. So we're looking at about, we're looking at an uneven number of 11 books for July to be read. Now I did actually just complete three of my Kindle books. So I'm actually trekking along already and it is the like 1st of July. So there's that. When you guys are seeing this, it's not going to be the 1st of July, obviously. Um, you know, I pre-record videos and then post them later on. So I do apologize for that, but it just makes it a lot easier on me, especially with work, um, work, the holidays, and just life in general. But let's get into these. I want to read the first chapter with you guys, and I'm going to determine that way what I'm taking back to the library today. Alright, so first things first is we have the uh, Go Ask Alice Anonymous series, book number six, called Calling Maggie May. She just wanted to feel special. So it's Friday, February 20th. After that last date, I'm thinking again about quitting, not for my parents, not for AD Ada, but because it might be the right thing for me. Maybe it's time to stop living in this crazy fantasy because it is starting to seem not so fantastic. It was supposed to be fun. She was always responsible at home, at school, at everything. Nothing was just for fun. Nothing was just for herself. But then an opportunity presented itself and she had to make a choice. A choice that would change everything. Now she has it all. No more worries about parents. No more worries about school. No more responsibility. But if no one's responsible, who does she turn to when her choice goes wrong? Read her story from the beginning and the diary she left behind. Um, we read Lucy in the Sky, Letting Anna Go, and I believe we haven't done the Book of David yet. I'm not sure. Wednesday, September 17th. Swim meet. First place in the freestyle today and second in backstroke. Calculus test, 97%. Tuesday, September 23rd. Swim meet. First place in backstroke. Third place overall. American history, 80% on quiz. Wednesday, October 1st. Chemistry, 92% on test, A on lab report. Math team, fourth place in meet, no prizes for fourth place, mom notes. Friday, October 3rd, English, A- minus on essay. Swim meet, third place in backstroke, second place in freestyle, didn't place overall. American history, B on paper. I deserved an A, but Mr. Franklin hates me, now I'm screwed. Why do I even bother? I'm only going, I'm only keeping this journal because mom is, is making me. Guess she's going for the Tiger Mom of the Year Award. You're a junior now. You have to keep track of all your accomplishments so you'll have things to write on your college applications. Right. Like, colleges really want to read this litany of mediocrity. mediocrity. What's the point of nothing? Noting all my near misses for the admissions committees. It worked for Mark. She sings songs in Chinese, smiling encouragingly. I'm not Mark. Do you hear that, Mom? Mark had straight A's all through high school. Mark lettered in three sports. Mark was editor of the newspaper. Mark won every debate, every science Olympiad, every math team meet, every, every everything. I get it, okay? Everyone gets it. Mark certainly does. I can see the pity for me in his eyes every time he comes home from college. His poor, stupid sister who can't do anything right. The only person who doesn't get it is Mom, who still believes I have it in me to be a genius, who still thinks I can get into Stanford if only I really apply myself. Mom is living in an FOB fantasy. Jenny Sue taught me that the other day, FOB for fresh off the boat, not that my parents are fresh anything. They emigrated from Taiwan more than 20 years ago before Mark and I were even born, but you never know it to talk to them. They still speak Chinese at home, and Mom switches into English only for words or phrases she has learned since coming here. A lot of these have to do with college applications. Dad isn't as bad. He works at a as a hospital administrator, so he speaks English all day, but with an accent that makes me cringe. I think I'd actually rather listen to him speak Chinese, even though I understand only like 70% of what they say. Maybe it's better that way. It's all nagging anyway. Sometimes I think Dad just wants me to be happy, but Mom would probably spit on that, fate, that phrase. So American, she would say in Chinese, coddling kids, telling them anything they do is fine. How are they going to be happy if they are not successful? 
She has a point, I guess. It's a tough world out there, and if you don't stay on top of it, you could be chewed up and spit out. I know she just wants the best for me. She worries that I am too Americanized because my Chinese is crap, not like Mark's. And I watch too much TV and my grades aren't perfect, but nothing is ever good enough for her. Well, that's not true. Mark is. But see above, I am not Mark. She would be so pissed if she knew I was just spewing random crap about my life in my special college prep journal. But it feels good to get it out. I'll just tear out this page later. Monday, October 6th. French, 96% on quiz. Swim meet, first place in backstroke, second place in freestyle, and butterfly, though that was a fluke. Second place overall. Chemistry, 95% on test. Good day. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, yeah, I would have a hard time with that, too. I have been, you know, compared to my sibling as well, and he was younger than me at the time. And it sucks, but it's whatever. You just gotta let it go. They just want the best for you, and tough love is tough love, though. I'll be honest. Alright, next we got Killjoy by Holly Jackson, the novella of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Six suspects, three hours, one murder. Pip is not in the mood for her friend's murder mystery party, especially one that involves 1920s fancy dress and pretending that their town is an island called Joy. But once the game begins, Pip finds herself drawn into the make-believe world of intrigue, deception, and murder. As Pitt plays detective, testing out the identity of the killer clue by clue, the murder of the fictional Reginald Remy isn't the only case on her mind. Welcome to the murder mystery party of the year. Fans of the hit series A Good Girl's Guide to Murder will love Pip's final detective case in this mystery novella from number one New York Times bestselling author Holly Jackson. I don't know. Interesting. All right. Dedicated to Mary Celia Collis, 1925 to 2020. Don't know who that is. You guys ready? I'm not. I need a minute. <laughs> okay. And dear Celia Bourne, a.k.a. Pip Fitz Amobi, you are cordially invited to come dine with me to celebrate my 74th birthday. The whole family will be in attendance for the weekend, and I expect you to be here, too. It will be a night to remember. Where? At Remy Manor, on Joy, my private island off the west coast of Scotland. Remember, the boat only leaves the mainland once a day at 12 p.m. sharp, and the journey takes two hours. But actually, just at Connor's house. When? This weekend. Next Saturday, at 7.30 p.m. Yours sincerely, Reginald Remy. But actually, it's from me, Connor. Please open this invitation for additional information. Your character. For this murder mystery game, you will be playing the role of Celia Bourne. You are the 29-year-old niece of Reginald Remy, the patriarch of the Remy family and owner of the Remy Hotels and Casinos Empire in London. You are an orphan. Your parents died when you were young, and you have never been truly welcomed into the Remy family, despite them being your only living relatives. You are bitter about this and the fact that the incredibly wealthy Reginald Remy has never offered to help you out financially. You currently work in London as a governess to a well-off family. Costume suggestions? Get ready to go back in time to 1924 and dive into the Roaring Twenties. A drop waist evening dress should do the trick. Accessorized with a headband and a feather boa. Other characters. 1. Robert Bobby Remy, the elder son of Reginald Remy, will be played by Aunt Lo. 2. Ralph Remy, the younger son of Reginald Remy, will be played by Zach Chen. 3. Lizzie Remy, the wife of Ralph Remy, will be played by Lauren Gibson. 4. Humphrey Todd, the butler at Remy Manor, will be played by Connor Reynolds. And 5. Dora Key, the cook at Remy Manor, will be played by Kara Ward. Prepare yourself for an unforgettable night of murder and mystery. Chapter 1. A smear of red across her thumb pressed into the hollows and spirals of her skin. Pip studied it like a maze. It could be blood if she squinted. It wasn't, but she could trick her eyes if she wanted to. It was Ruby Woo, the red lipstick her mom had insisted she wear to complete the 1920s look. Pip kept forgetting about it and accidentally touching her mouth, another smudge there on her little finger. Blood stains everywhere, standing out against her pale skin. They pulled up outside the Reynolds' house. Pip had always thought the house looked like a face, the window staring down at her. 
We're here, Pickle, her dad said needlessly from the front of the car. He turned to her, a wide smile on his face, creasing his black skin and the gray fleck beard he was trying out for summer. Much to her mom's dismay. Have fun. I'm sure it'll be a night to die for. Pip groaned. How long had he been planning to say that? Zack, beside her, gave a polite laugh. Zack was her neighbor. The Chens lived four doors down from the Amobis, so Pip and Zack were always in and out of each other's cars, getting rides to and back together. Pip had her own car now since she turned 17, but it was in the shop this weekend, almost like her dad had planned it so they'd have to suffer through those terrible murder-based jokes. Anymore, Pip said, wrapping the black feather boa around her arms, making them look even whiter. She opened the door, pausing to roll her eyes at him. Oh, it looks could kill, her dad sighed with a little too much flair. There was always one more. Okay, goodbye, dad, she said, stepping out, Zach mirroring her on the other side, thanking Mr. Amobi for the lift. Have fun, you both look dressed to kill. And another. Annoyingly, Pip couldn't help but laugh at that one. Oh, and Pip? Kara's dad is giving you a lift back. If you get home before mom and I are back from the movie, will you let the dog out? Yes, yes. She waved him off, walking up to the front door side by side with Zach. He looked slightly ridiculous in a red blazer with navy stripes, crisp white pants, and a black bow tie with a straw boater hat covering his straight dark hair. His little name badge read Ralph Remy. Ready, Ralph? She asked, pressing the doorbell, and then again. She was impatient to get this over and done with. Sure, she hadn't seen her friends all together in weeks, and maybe this would be fun. But she had work waiting for her at home, and fun, after all, was just a waste of time. Still, she could pretend well enough and pretend tending wasn't lying. After you, Celia, born, Zach smiled as she could tell he was excited. Maybe she'd have to pretend a little better, arranging a grin on her face, too. It was Connor who opened the door, except he didn't exactly look like Connor Reynolds anymore. He put some kind of colored wax in his normally dark blonde hair. It was now gray and pasted neatly back from his face. There were brown wiggly face paint lines around his eyes, a poor attempt at wrinkles. He was wearing a black tuxedo, it had to have been borrowed from his dad, and a matching white waistcoat and bow tie with a napkin folded over one arm. Good evening, Connor bowed low at some of his gray hairs unsticking and flopping forward with him. Welcome back to Remy Manor. I'm the butler, Humphrey Todd, he said, emphasis on the hump. There was a sequel or a squeal as Lauren appeared in the hallway behind Connor. She was wearing a red flapper dress, the tassels on the hem skimming her knees. A bell-shaped hat hid most of her ginger hair, and there was a strain of pearls wrapped around her neck, knocking against her Lizzie Remy badge. Is that my husband? She said excitedly, bounding forward and dragging poor Zach into the house after her. I see everyone's already far too excited, Pip said, following Connor down the hall. Ah, well, it's good you've arrived to bring us all back down, he teased her. She widened her grin and pretended even harder. Your parents home? she asked. No, they're away for the weekend, and Jamie's out, house to ourselves. Connor's brother Jamie was six years older than them, but he'd been living at home ever since he dropped out of college. Pip remembered back when it happened how like the tension had been in the Reynolds' house, how they'd all learned to tiptoe around it. Now it was one of those not-talked-about topics. They arrived in the kitchen where Lauren had towed Zach and was now handing him a drink. Karen and Aunt were there, too, with matching glasses of red wine, an improvement on whatever concoctions they usually made from half-full bottles in unguarded drink cab drinks cabinets. Hello, Madam Pip. Kara, Pip's best friend, said in a terrible cockney accent, sidling forward to fiddle with Pip's feather bow before lifting it flop it back against her garish emerald green eyes or green dress. Pip missed her normal overalls. How fancy. Third store, Pip replied, taking in Kara's costume. She was wearing a frumpy black dress with a long white co cook's apron, her dark blonde hair covered by a gray bandana. She had also gone for the face paint wrinkle look, slightly more subtle and effective than Connor's. How old is your character supposed to be? Pip asked. Oh, ancient. 56. You look 86. Aunt snorted and Pip turned to him finally. He might have looked the most outlandish of them all, dressed in a pinstriped suit that was far too baggy on a small frame, a glossy white tie, a black bowler hat, and a giant fake mustache stuck to his upper lip. To freedom in summer, Aunt said, holding up his wine for a moment before he took a sip. The mustache dipped into the liquid, droplets clinging to it as he reemerged from the glass. 
the freedom aunt meant was that they had all now finished their sats it was the end of june and the first time they'd all hung out like this all six of them in a while despite living in the same town and attending the same school well yes except it's not really summer because we still have a month left of school plus there's college applications coming up and we have to pick our topics for the senior capstone project soon Okay, maybe she needed a little more practice pretending. She couldn't help it. There had been a twang of guilt in her chest since she left the house, reminding her that she really should have started work on that project today, even though she'd had her last exam only yesterday. Work breaks didn't sit well with Pip, Fitz, and Moby, and Freedom didn't feel very free. Oh my god, do you ever take a night off? Lauren said, her eyes and thumbs down on her phone. Aunt jumped in. We can give you some homework if that will make you feel better. You probably already picked your topic anyway, Kara said, forgetting her accent. I haven't, Pip said, and that was the problem. Fuck, are you okay? Do you need us to call an ambulance? Pip stuck her middle finger up at him and used it to flick his fluffy, like, fake mustache. No one touches the mustache, he said, backing away. It's sacred, and I'm sacred, and I'm scared you'll pull out the real mustache underneath. As if you could grow a real mustache, Lauren snorted, eyes still down on her phone. She and Aunt had had a very short-lived doomed romance last year, which had amounted to approximately four drunken kisses. Now they were lucky if they could pry Lauren away from her current boyfriend, Tom, who was no doubt on the other end of that phone screen. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Connor cleared his throat, grabbing another bottle of wine and a Coke for Pip. If you, could, if you would all care to follow me into the dining room... Even me, the humble cook, Kara said. Even you, Connor smiled, leading them across the hall toward the dining room at the back of the house. It was still there, the chip in the doorframe from when Connor had been skateboarding inside when they were 12. Pip had told him not to at the time, but did anyone ever listen to her? As Connor opened the door, she, the muffled squealing sounds from within became jazz music coming from the Alexa in the corner of the room. The dining table had been extended and covered with a white cloth crisscrossed with fold lines, and three long, thin candles flickered in the middle, dribbling red wax down their sides. The places had already been set, plates, wine glasses, silverware, and linens all laid out in a little place card on each plate. Pip's eyes sought out Celia Bourne. She found her seat between Dora Key, Kara, and Humphrey Todd, Connor, directly opposite Aunt. What's for dinner? Zach said, holding his empty plate as he took his seat on the other side of the table. Oh, yes. What have I, the cook, made for dinner, butler dear? Connor grinned. I think tonight you probably ordered Domino's after you realized that making dinner for this many people on top of hosting a murder mystery party was too much effort. Ah, take out pizza, my signature dish, Kara said, rearranging her heavy dress so she could take her seat. Pip settled down as well, her eyes falling to the small booklet to the right of her plate, which was printed with the title Killjoy Games Murder at Remy Manor. It had her game name on it, too, Celia Bourne. No one touched her booklets yet, Connor said, and Pip hastily withdrew her hand, rebuffed. Connor stood in front of the wide windows. It was still light outside, although there was a strange pink-gray glow as heavy clouds rolled in to claim the evening. The wind was picking up, too, making the trees at the end of the yard dance howling between the gaps in the music. Right. First things first, Connor announced, holding on a Tupperware, out a Tupperware box. Hand over your phones. Wait, what? Lauren looked disgusted. Yeah. It's 1924. We wouldn't have phones, and I want us all to concentrate on the game. Aunt dropped his in. Yeah, he said, because you just spend the whole time texting your boyfriend. I would not, Lauren protested, sullenly placing her phone in the box, too. The rest of them were quiet. They'd all been thinking the same, and in that silence, Pip swore she heard something upstairs. Like the shuffle of footsteps, but no, it couldn't be. They were home alone, Connor had said. She must have imagined it, or maybe it was just the rattle of the wind. Pip collected her and Kara's phones and placed them in the plastic box. Thank you, Connor said with a butler-esque bow. He took the Tupperware over to the sideboard at the back of the room and made a great show of placing the box inside a drawer and then locking it with a small key. He then took the key and placed it on top of the radiator. Pip caught Lauren eyeing it. Right, so from now on, everyone has to stay in character. Yep, it's me, Bobby, Aunt said. And then wrapping his arm around Zach's shoulder, he added, me and my bro. Pip surveyed them. So those were Celia Bourne's cousins, Ralph and Bobby Remy. Ugh, spoiled brats. Very good, sir. But isn't it peculiar that we are all gathered for a meal to celebrate Reginald Remy's 74th birthday and he hasn't turned up for dinner? He paused and looked at them all pointedly. Yes, um, very peculiar, Carrie said. Very unlike my uncle, added Pip. Zach nodded. Father is never late. 
Connor please smiled, pleased with himself. Well, he must be somewhere in the manor. We ought to go and look for him. They all watched him closely. I said we ought to go and look for him. Connor repeated. Oh, like actually go look for him? Yeah, he must be somewhere. Let's split up and search. Pip jumped to her feet and filed out of the room with the others. Well, Reginald Remy had obviously just been murdered. It was a murder mystery game after all. But what were they looking for exactly? A picture of the dead man or something? They passed the closet in the hallway that had a piece of paper stuck to it with the words Billard Broom written on it. Zach pulled the closet doors open and peered inside. He's not in the billiard room, and neither is a billiard table for that matter. <laughs> Karen and Aunt started tussling, racing to be the first to reach the living room door, which had been labeled the library, but Pip's feet pulled her the other way. Toward the stairs, Zach right on her heels. If she had actually heard something, it must have come from above the dining room, but what was it? They were home alone. They climbed up, but at the top, they broke apart. Zach heading off hesitantly toward Connor's bedroom and pipped the other way to the room that sat directly above the dining room. She knew that this room was Connor's dad's office, but the door told her that tonight it was Reginald Romy's study. The door creaked as she pushed it open. It was dark in here, the blinds shutting out the last of the evening light. Her eyes adjusted to a room full of half-formed shadows. She'd never been inside this room before, and she felt a prickle of unease up her neck. When Was she even allowed in here? Pip could see the dark, hulking form of the desk against the far wall and what must have been a swivel chair, but something wasn't right. The chair was facing the wrong way, pointing toward her, and there was a shadow disrupting its clean outline. There was something in that chair, or someone. Pip felt her heart kick up in her chest as her fingers sc scaled the wall, searching for the light switch. She found it and flicked it, holding her breath. The yellow light blinked on, filling in the shadows. Pip was right. There was someone slumped in that chair, and then her heart dropped, soured in her gut, and all she could see was the blood. So much blood. Ah! That actually sounds really, really good. I'm super excited for it. Super, super, super excited for it. All right, give me a second. All right, next we got with my little eye by Jocelyn Jackson. Looks like this. And it says... Oh, it started with the letters for actress Maribel Mills, disturbing fan mail is part of the price of fame. So when she starts getting creepy letters written in fruit scented marker, she is mostly unfazed and diligently files them along with her other messages from unhinged fans. After all, she's a single mom approaching 40, not the kind of hot young slub who sparks dangerous obsessions, but there's something different about Marker Man. He's been in her home. He's watching her. Um... Who else might be watching her ex-husband, the lover she left behind in L.A., her new neighbor? Suddenly, every man in her life is a suspect, but she can't keep herself and her daughter safe from a monster she can't identify. When the paths of all these men collide, Maribel will find herself alone in the fight of her life. Desperate to protect those she loves as danger closes in from all sides. If he can't have her, no one can. Um, by the way, just so you guys know, this is like 12 pages long the first chapter <laughs> all right july 17 or july 27th 2016 maribel mills co L liza coombs creative endeavors agency 2122 avenue of the stars los angeles california 967 maribel this isn't a fan letter i am not your fan though of course i find you beautiful of course i love your work i like to have you on my small screen to freeze you and rewind you you move for me frame by frame stopping when your eyes turn toward me i can see your secret spaces you toss your hair and cock your hip flaunting your beauty your cruelty but secretly you yearn for me to take you in hand to make you soften and soften and open this letter asks a lot of you, I know, but you will not fail me. You could never. So look past these simple words through the page and see me clear like I see you. You know me already. Can't you feel it? You can. Hold the paper to your face. Breathe in all the sweetness. We will be sweet together. I will be sweet to you when you are good. This is, in fact, a letter from your destiny. Destiny is coming for you. I never thought that I was famous enough to get murdered. I had a small shiny role on a popular sitcom in the 90s, some little parts in little movies, and a lot of guest spots on detective shows. That's not the kind of actress who gets Madonna stalked, but here I was, hunted. It took about a year from the date of this first letter, but he drove me out of L.A. Three weeks ago, I moved myself and my daughter, Honor, all the way across the country to get away from him. New phone, new email, new forwarding service. I wanted to feel safe. I wanted to do normal things, like sit here in a 
Chi Chi Coffee House, so belligerently air conditioned against August that I had ordered my Americano hot, like chat with my new neighbor, Cooper, but all at once I felt my spine stiffen and elongate. My mouth went dry. Cooper and I were in the middle of a deep dive talk about our exes, a bonding point for us, when he heard me suck in sudden air. He stopped talking mid-sentence and cocked his head concerned. What? I tried to make my shoulders relax. I'm being watched. Really? Cooper swiveled around, blatantly looking. He was more interested than alarmed, but all my skin was tingling and my chest felt tight. Really? Don't be so obvious, I said, though I was looking all around, too. No one was looking back. Whoever was watching didn't want to get caught. My heart rate picked up. This was how I'd felt in L.A. for months now. It should not be happening in Atlanta, especially here, so close to my new home. Java House was inside my actual building on the first floor, along with a CVS, a deli, and the mailroom. I breathed in deep, trying to calm down. Cooper was the most interesting human I'd met since moving back to Georgia. Urbane and easygoing, and I needed a friend. I made myself smile. How do you know? I can feel it. I almost always can. Is that an actor thing? He liked hearing about my job. Yeah, I think a lot of actors have that superpower. It was true, but this, this reactive fear was not an actor thing. Honor had a janky kind of relentlessness that got into her body on hard days. She would say, Mom, I'm full of bees, and I would rub her feet or cans with lotion until she calmed, or walk with her in his circles if it was bad enough that touch made it worse. I'd assumed it was part of her autism, but ever since my stalker got dead serious, I had an inkling what she meant. Moving 2,000 miles away was supposed to fix this, but I was instantly so full of bees I could practically hear humming. Cooper pretended to stretch so he could look behind himself, hamming up the cell to amuse me. I laughed, but I was surreptitiously giving closer scrutiny to every man in the place. A 40-something in line, patting his wispy goatee and reading a paperback. Two businessmen, not together, one in a red tie, one in a brown sports coat, both tapping into laptops at the tech bar. A college kid playing on his phone. 20 bucks says it's him, and he's working out exactly how to make a move on you, Cooper said, tilting his head at the first businessman. Never trust a power tie. You're on, I said, shaking on it, trying to mirror his playful tone, keep it light. None of the men seemed the least bit interested in me. Even so, when Cooper let go of my hand, it moved of its own volition to press my chest. One of Cooper's dark blonde eyebrows corked. Are you okay? He didn't touch me again, though. I liked this about Cooper most of all. He clearly found me interesting and charming, but he was too hung up on his ex to try to get me into bed. I was too hung up on mine to want to go. Not now, anyway. There was a little piece of me that thought if we did become good friends, who knew where that might lead. One day, but for now, we were compatriots who'd lost in love wars, each bided our own wounds. Of course, I said, he's not here. He can't be here. I was trembling, though. I hid my hands in my lap, mostly for myself. I didn't want to feel this. Honor and I had fully unpacked into our midtown high-rise sublet, and our fresh start was going well. Well enough, anyway. We'd moved in such a hurry that I had to pick out our condo online. It was darling, and as advertised, but the neighborhood was sketched. Right now, over Cooper's shoulder, I could see a homeless guy, twitchy, his skin picked open, panhandling in front of the big window. The nearby park was a patchy grass dog run full of harried adults juggling coffees and poop bags, and more than once when I walked Gumball there, I'd seen condoms and used needles by the benches. But Honor was adjusting well to both the new school and a new therapist. The few grades she'd gotten so far were her usual A's, and though there had been some bumps and a lot of stim stimming, she'd had zero five-star meltdowns. I was excited about my job, which was starting to feel real. I was meeting the costume designer for fittings tomorrow. I was also breathing Georgia air on the daily, calm and easy like a normal person who didn't hate Georgia. All I needed now was a friend outside the industry. I wanted this not a date with Cooper to go well. You don't seem okay. I made myself smile and look at him instead of all around. Whoever was watching me was good at it. Hard to catch. I'm a little nerved up. It's so strange being home, or back here anyway. LA is home. I haven't set foot in Georgia for 20 years. I wouldn't even take flights that paused in the Atlanta airport. He chuckled, but only because I'd said it as if I were kidding. I wasn't. He said, I get that. I'm the same way with Texas. My dad was one of those, hey, son, let's be extra hairy and hate our wives and go drink beer and shoot things, guys. He did not know what to do with me. 
Cooper talked about galleries and plays, read novels, did the Times crossword over coffee, trying to picture him slogging out into the woods to murder deer in his buttery leather. Mephisto loafers made me smile in spite of my nerves. He glanced around again, then added, I don't see anyone staring. I'm sure it's nothing. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah. So, Addie texted last night. Wants to talk, she says. Shook my head. You know she means get back together, right? I hadn't heard from my ex, Cam, not once. Well, I've been pretty decisive when I broke it off. He shrugged. That's what she meant the last two times. They'd been on and off for a while now. I shouldn't go. None of our problems have changed. He paused, his blue eyes flashing pain, but then he shrugged and said, I'll probably go. He was absolutely going to go. I could see it. Maybe it would work out for them. Maybe she and I would become friends, too. I knew she was a single mother with an only child like me. How old is her daughter? Honor had yet to evince the slightest interest in the kids at her new middle school. On Monday, I told her that if she could learn the names of three classmates this week, I'd take her for ice cream. That at very afternoon, she'd rattle off 20 names. Last then first in perfect alphabetical order and ended with rocky road please <laughs> she'd memorize her homeroom roll sheet oh no cooper said reading my intention he smoothed the sides of his golden brown hair it was thick and sleek and needed zero smoothing she lives deep in the wilds of high school and this last year it's been all boys and sneaking out i suspect drinking it's killing Addie, who doesn't deserve this shit she blames shelia's father who hasn't called his kid in months the stress of all this is probably why we keep breaking up Addie's the sweetest person but one day i bet the police will find chunks of her ex-husband in her freezer all the chunks she doesn't eat anyway he smiled wryly but i could see he was still hurting anyway given the givens sheila's not a good match for honor bright under the table my foot had started jouncing i was still being watched and it felt stealthy and insidious i stilled and made myself breathe slowly in and out i checked all the men again staring and ending with power tied the man cooper had bet on i didn't catch any of them staring or even looking hastily away but i could feel eyes watching shivery trails crawling across my skin I gave a quick glance behind me. The table there had been empty last time I looked. Now a young woman sat with her phone out, staging a mini photo shoot with her latte and her novel. She was unaware of my existence, and she looked about as dangerous as a glass of whole milk. I turned back to Cooper, making myself smile, but a clammy, shaking piece of me felt sure that the gaze I felt skittering over me belonged to a predator, my predator. Marker man, Honor called him, because his envelopes came addressed in huge, jagged handwriting that gl- glared cherry pink or lime green or blue ch- blueberry or berry blue they stank of alcohol solvent and stick sickly sweet faux fruit i had never let my kid read his notes but a couple of months ago they'd stopped coming to cea co my current agent liza liza coombs and began showing up in the mailbox at my quadplex in la honor brought the mail in most days so there was no way for her not to notice them the letters inside were also written in cheap scented marker as if i were being stalked by a ditzy teenage girl but there was nothing innocent or fun about the things he wrote the graphic pictures he drew i realized my foot was bouncing again a jerky rhythm i stopped it i could still feel that palpable gaze creeping over my face my body i told myself i was being paranoid i'd uprooted my daughter left my friends broken up with the first truly interesting man i dated in a decade and traded perfect year-round weather for the sticky hot swamp air of a state i had i hated all to make us safe. I was safe. So why couldn't I stop scanning the coffee house looking for what? I wouldn't recognize Marker Man even if I, he was a breath away. I'd never seen his face. I need to get home. I'm supposed to be reading a movie script. I was finished, actually, but I wanted a locked door between me and every other set of human eyes. Sure, I'm in the middle of a project anyway, Cooper said with zero urgency. He ran his own small business, designating motion graphics. But I'd rather he also had family money. Mind if I grab a quick refill? I need caffeine. He was already rising. I did mind. I didn't want to sit here alone feeling exposed. I wanted to be home, and I fought the urge to drive right to the school, snatch Honor out, and take her home, too. My rational brain knew she was safe, and she needed more independence. Last week, she texted me a link to an article about helicopter parenting. Her 13th birthday was coming up soon in September. How had my kid gotten this close to teenagerhood so fast? And her need for for space was real. I wanted us to be safe enough for her to have some freedom. It was a huge part of why I'd taken a part on a show that filmed in Georgia of all places. Granted, it was a great part, a fat recurring role on the second season of last year's breakout hit. My character, the new lawyer at a firm that specialized in... Representing ghosts, because sure, why not, had a pickup option to become a series regular if it went well. 
No way in hell, I told Eliza when the offer came. Even if the spirit of the thing shot in New York or Montreal, I doubted I would have uprooted my change of verse kid from the only life she'd ever known. Then Mark Roman escalated. It got very, very bad. So here I was, feeling a gaze brushing along my skin like bug feet, making me shudder. I told myself it wasn't him. His practice predatory stare was the only gaze I couldn't feel. After all, I'd never caught him, not once, and he'd been stalking me like I was prey for over a year. Cooper had already put in his order. He waited beside Power Ty, who had come for a refill and who was talking theatrically into a headset loud enough to teach the room he was important. I wanted to go upstairs, if Cooper was getting his drink to go anyway. I know your face, but I don't know your name, a male voice said. It's driving me nuts. I think if he had touched me, I would have leapt out of my chair in a panic and popped him in one, him one. As it was, I jerked and gasped, barely swallowing a shriek. He was built tall and square, looming up over me like a slab of human wall. Oops, snuck up on you there, huh? He said, chuckling. A little, I said. It was the guy in the brown sports coat who'd been working at the, bent, the tech bar. But we've met. I'm positive. I have one of those faces, I told him, terse. Still, he hovered. Wait, do you work with Craig Fillmore at the bank? The question was so ordinary, almost goofy. Half the tension ran out of my spine. He was still standing a little too close, but now, instead of a threat, I saw someone's bland ex-husband with a comb over and vegan leather shoes trying to flirt. Oh, well, he's trying to flirt, so I guess that's all right, right? Yeah, we're going to stop it there. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's really good so far, but like the 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 font is just so small and so annoying. So many words on a page. I'm just like, I want to read it. I want to love it. I do. I do. I do. Okay. Next, we're gonna do Cass Morgan and Danielle Page as the Ravens. These sorority girls are real witches. Only their sisterhood can save them. At first glance, the sisters of ultra exclusive Kappa Rho knew the Ravens. Seem like typical sorority girls. Ambitious, beautiful, and smart. They're the most powerful girls on Westerly College's Savannah, Georgia campus. That's interesting that that one was in Georgia and this one's in Georgia now. But the Ravens aren't just regular sorority girls. They're witches. Scarlet Winter has always known she's a witch and she's determined to be the sorority's president, just like her mother and sister before her. But if a painful secret from her past ever comes to light, she could lose absolutely everything. Vivi Diver... Devero has no idea she's a witch and she's never lived in one place long enough to make a friend. So when she gets a coveted bid to fledge the raven, she vows to do whatever it takes to be part of the magical sisterhood. The only thing standing in her way is Scarlet, who doesn't think Vivi is raven's material. But when a wicked power rises on campus, the girls will have to put their rivalry aside to save their fellow sister. Someone has discovered the raven secret and that someone will do anything to see these witches burn. Ooh! Okay. There's a prologue. Okay, and the chapter's not that long, so just bear with me, guys. I know. But I gotta pause you because there's literally a train coming, and it is so loud because it's in my backyard. Not kidding. Train's making me think of my dad because he works in a train yard back home. Okay, so there's a prologue, and then there's a chapter, which I think is like eight pages, so. The witch looked at the blonde girl cowering on the ground, her eyes wide with fear. Don't look at me that way. I told you, I don't want to do this. The witch said as she drew the circle, lit the candles, and checked the contents of the bubbling cauldron. The knife, already sharpened, glinted on the altar next to her offering. The girl moaned in response, tears streaking down her face. Her mouth was bound, but her words rang crystal clear in the witch's head. Remember who I am. Remember who you are. Remember the ravens. The witch hardened her heart. No doubt the girl thought she sensed an opportunity in her captor's apologetic tone. A chance to persuade her to stop. A chance to hope. A chance to live. It was too late for that. Magic didn't preach. It gave and took. This was the gift. This was the cost. The witch knelt beside the girl and tested the bonds one last time. Tight, though not enough to cut off her circulation. She wasn't a monster. The girl's screams began again, piercing through the gag stuffed in her mouth. The witch gritted her teeth. She'd much prefer the girl to be unconscious, but the right she dug up had been very specific. If this was going to work, she needed to do it perfectly. If it didn't, she shut her eyes. She couldn't think about that possibility. It had to work. There was no other way. She picked up the knife and began to chant. 
In the end, she was surprised at how easy it was. A slash and a shower of red, followed by the unmistakable electric crackle of magic bleeding into the air. Magic that was now all hers. All right, you got Vivi. Vivian, Daphne DeVereaux, stood in her daughter's doorway. Her face twisted in exaggerated anguish, even in the unfortunate unforgiving reno heat she wore a floor-length black house coat edged in gold tassels and had wrapped a velvet scarf around her dark unruly hair you can't go i've had a premonition vivi glanced at her mother suppressed a sigh and returned to her packing she was leaving for westerly college in savannah that afternoon and was trying to fit her entire life into two suitcases and a backpack luckily vivi had had a lifetime of practice. Whenever Daphne DeVoe got one of her premonitions, they tended to leave the next morning, unpaid rent, and unpacked belongings be, be damned. It's healthy to start fresh sugar snap, Daphne said once when eight-year-old Vivi be begged to go back for her stuffed hippo, Philip. You don't want to carry that bad, bad energy with you. Let me guess, Vivi said now, shoving several books into her backpack. Daphne was moving too, trending, trading Reno for Louisville, and Vivi didn't trust her mom to take her library. You've seen a powerful darkness headed my way. It's not safe for you at that place. Vivi closed her eyes and took what she hoped would be a calming breath. Her mother hadn't been able to bring herself to say the word college for months. It's called Westerly. It's not a curse word. Far from it. Westerly was Vivi's lifeline. She'd been shocked when she received a full scholarship to Westerly, a school she'd considered to be a way out of her league. Vivi had always been a strong student, but she'd attended three different high schools, two of which she'd started mid-year, and her transcript contained nearly as many incompletes as it did A's. Daphne, however, had been adamantly against it. You'll hate Westerly. I'd never set foot on that campus. That was what sealed the deal for Vivi. If her mom hated it that much, it was clearly the perfect place for Vivi, Vivi to start a brand new life. As Daphne stood mournfully in the doorway, Vivi looked at the westerly calendar she tacked to the yellowing wall. The only decoration she bothered with this time around. Of all the places they lived over the years, this apartment was her least favorite. It was a stucco-filled two-bedroom above a pawn shop in Reno, and the whole place reeked of cigarettes and its desperation. Much like the whole dusty state of Nevada. The calendar's photos... Glossy oats to ivy-covered buildings and mossy live oaks had become a beacon of hope. They were a reminder of something better, a future she could carve out for herself, away from her mother and her portents of evil. But then she saw the tears in her mother's eyes and Vivi felt her frustration relent just a little. Although Daphne was a supremely accomplished actress, a necessity when your livelihood depended on parting strangers from their money, she'd never been able to fake tears. Vivi abandoned her picking, uh, packing and took a few steps across her cramped bedroom toward her mother. It's going to be okay, Mom. I won't be gone long. Thanksgiving will be here before you know it. Her mother sniffed and extended her pale arm. Vivi shared her mother's fair coloring, which meant that she burned after 15 minutes in the desert sun. Look what I drew as your cross card. It was a tarot card. Daphne made a living, reading the fortunes of all the sad, wretched people who sought her out and forked over good money in exchange for bullshit platitudes. Yes, your lazy husband will work, will find work soon. No, your Debbie dad doesn't hate you. In fact, he's trying to find you too. As a child, Vivi had loved watching her beautiful mother dazzle the customers with her wisdom and glamour. But as she grew older, seeing her mother profiting from their pain began to set Vivi's teeth on edge. She couldn't bear to watch people being taken advantage of, yet there was nothing she could do about it. Daphne's readings were their one source of income, the only way to pay for their shitty apartments and discount groceries. But not anymore. Vivi had finally found a way out, a new beginning far from her mother's impulsive behaviors. The kind that had led them to uproot their whole lives time and again based on nothing more than Daphne's premonitions. Let me guess. Vivi said, raising an eyebrow at the tarot card in her mother's hand. Death? Her mother's face darkened, and when Daphne spoke, her normally melodic voice was chillingly sharp and quiet. Vivi, I know you don't believe in tarot, but for once, just listen to me. Vivi took the card and turned it over. Sure enough, a skeleton carrying a scythe glared up from the card. Its eyes were hollowed out gouges, and its mouth curved up in an almost gleeful leer. Disembodied hands and feet pushed up from the loomy earth as she sun as the sun sank in a blood-red sky. Vivi felt an odd tremor of vertigo, like she was standing at the edge of a great precipice and looking down into a vast nothingness instead of standing in her bedroom where the only views of 
was the neon yellow we buy gold sign across the street i told you westerly isn't a safe place not for people like you you have an ability to see beyond the veil if it makes you a target for dark forces beyond the veil Vivi repeated wearily, I thought you weren't going to say stuff like that anymore. Throughout Vivi's childhood, Daphne had tried to draw her into her world of tarot and seances and crystals, claiming that Vivi had special powers, waiting to be unlocked. She'd even trained Vivi to do simple readings for clients who'd been mesmerized by the sight of a small child communing with the spirits. But eventually, Vivi had realized the truth. She didn't have any power. She just She was just another pawn in her mother's game. I can't control which card I draw. It's foolish to ignore a warning like this. A horn honked outside and someone yelled an expl expletive. Vivi sighed and shook her head. But you taught me yourself that death is a symbol of transformation. Vivi tried to hand the card back to her mother, but Daphne's arms remained resolutely at her sides. Obviously, that's what it means. College is my fresh start. No more random midnight move moves to new cities. No uprooting themselves every time Vivi was about to finally form a real friendship. For the next four years, she could reinvent herself as a normal college student. She'd make friends, have a social life, maybe sign up for a few extracurricular activities, or at the very least, figure out what activities she enjoyed. They'd moved around so much that she hadn't had the chance to get good at anything. She'd been forced to quit the flute after three months in abandoned softball mid-season, and she'd given up intro to French so many times that all she knew how to reliably say was Bonjour, je m'appelle Vivian Jesus Novel. Her mother shook her head. In the reading, death was accompanied by the Ten of Swords and the Tower. Betrayal and sudden violence, Vivian. I have a terrible feeling. Vivi gave up and tucked the card into her suitcase, then reached up and took Daphne's hands in hers. This is a big change for both of us, okay? It's okay to be upset. Just tell me you're going to miss me like a normal parent would instead of turning this into some sign from the spirit world. Her mother squeezed her hands tightly. I know I can't make this decision for you. Then stop trying to, please. Vivi laced her fingers through her mother's the way she used to when she was little. I don't want to spend our last day fighting. Daphne's shoulders slumped as if she'd finally realized this was a lo losing battle. Promise me you'll be careful. Remember, things aren't always as they appear. Even something that seems good can be dangerous. Is this really your way of telling me I'm secretly evil? Her mother gave her a withering look. Just be smart, Viv. That I can definitely do. Vivi's smile widened enough to make Daphne roll her eyes. I've raised an egomaniac, but her mother leaned in to hug her all the same. I blame you for all the your magic and you can do anything talks, Vivi said, letting go of her hands to finish zipping the suitcase shut. I'll be careful, I promise. And she would be. She knew how she knew bad things could happen in college. Bad things happen everywhere, but Daphne was fooling herself if she thought some silly tarot reading meant anything. There was no such thing as magic, or so Vivi thought. Okay, and that sounds good. I'm so ready for it. Is there another trade coming? Well, it is Monday. <laughs> no. No, it's not. Wait. I don't know what day it is. When the train goes by, we're going to do Delicious Monsters by Lizelle Sanberry. Because it looks really good. And it's really short. Well, it's long, but short chapters. Shorter chapters. There's literally another train coming. But it doesn't sound like a full train. Guys, there's so much graffiti on it. I wish you could see it. I love it. Okay, so we have Delicious Monsters by Lizelle Sanbury. And it says, The brick walls and triangular boxy roofing reminded me of old Toronto homes, though it seemed to have its own unique charm. It was well-maintained, but had the vibe of a place that had ex existed for a long time. It looks haunted, I said, sliding my eyes to mom, a half-smile on my lips. A self-indulgent joke, though I suddenly realized that I couldn't see any dead. Usually they would enjoy something like this old, unoccupied house. I noticed mom hadn't responded and turned to her. She was staring at the house. It almost looked like she had the beginnings of tears in her eyes. We're going to make it work. We are, aren't we? Something curled in the pit of my stomach and I refused to acknowledge it as fear. I couldn't mess this up. Not after everything. 
So Daisy sees dead people, something impossible to forget and bustling goes packed to Toronto. She usually manages to deal with her unwanted ability, but she's completely unprepared to be dumped by her boyfriend. So when her mother inherits a secluded mansion in northern Ontario where she spent her childhood summers, Daisy jumps at the chance to escape, but the house is nothing like Daisy expects, and she begins to realize that her experience with the supernatural might be no match for her mother's secrets, nor what lurks within these walls. A decade later, Brittany is desperate to get out from under the thumb of her abusive mother. A best-selling author who claims her stay at Miracle Mansion allowed her to see the error of her ways, but Brittany knows that's nothing but a sham. She decides she, the new season of her popular Haunted web series will uncover what happened to a young black girl in the mansion 10 years prior and finally expose her mother's lies, but she gets more wrapped up in the investigation. She'll have to decide if she can only bring one story to light which one matters most, Daisy's or her own? As Brittany investigates the mansion in the present, Daisy's story runs parallel in the past, both timelines propelling the girls to face the most dangerous monsters of all, those that hide in plain sight. Sounds interesting, but then again, it doesn't sound interesting. Um, it says, to my mom, I am so proud and grateful to be your daughter. That's kind of cute. I'm not reading the author's note. I never do. Okay, chapter one, Daisy. There were two stories of how I was named. One was that one was what mom told people, never casually, only if they asked. It was a dream of a, a drive long enough that you strain not to doze off, mingle with the extra sweet tang of wild blueberries. All of Ontario seemed to be built along rough gray roads stretching seemingly forever into the distance where rolling down your window meant breathing in the sharp smell of burned rubber and stinging asphalt. The sort of tar black road that scorched your feet with its heat and left the scent of your heels smoky and stained, lingering in the air. In this dream, Mom pulled onto the shoulder, bright emergency blinkers flashing on an empty highway. When I was little, growing up in a city, it was hard to picture a place I knew to be packed and busy, suddenly devoid, like a ghost town, abandoned, with Mom as its only inhabitant. She stepped over the squat meter squat metal barrier between expressway and earth careful with the swollen bump of her belly she walked into the wreckage of fallen trees burnt branches and crumbling to white ash that's stuck to her fingers and still smelled of fire that's where she found the blueberries they grew in patches short small and wild alive in a field of death you can find the best blueberries after a burn she'd say and there in the midst of gathering and sweet fruit into the hem of her car sweaty t-shirt her tongue stained purple with juice, she found something else. A daisy, inexplicably, in a place where only one plant seems to grow, was this other thing that shouldn't have survived. That was where my name came from. Now, the second story. The one where Grandpa, Grandma whispered that, of course, a 16-year-old would name her kid after a flower, which meant that the second story wasn't a story at all, because that was the point, that there wasn't one. That my name was nothing more than a pretty tattoo, permanent and meaningless. Okay, so the next one is No Name. Chapter 3 is Brittany. And then it goes Daisy, then it goes Brittany, then it goes Daisy, then it goes Brittany. So, yeah. Definitely something I'm kind of, like, really interested in, but I want to see if I can find it on audio, maybe. All right. And then, of course, I'm going to be picking up The Surrogate Mother by Frida McFadden. I've had this book for a hot minute, and I really need to read it. All right, I'll read the prologue to you of this one. It says she's your worst nightmare. It says, in the next 24 hours, I will be arrested for first-degree murder. I don't know how this could be happening. I'm not the kind of person who goes to jail for murder. I'm not. I've never even gotten a speeding ticket. Hell, I've never even jaywalk before. I'm the most law-abiding citizen who ever was. They have a pretty solid case against you, Abby. My lawyer, Robert Frisch, does not sugarcoat things. I've only known him a short time, but I already know he's not about hand-holding and gumdrops and lollipops. He has spent the last 20 minutes enumerating all the police department's evidence against me, and when I hear it all laid out for me like that, it sounds bad. If I were some neutral third party listening to everything Frisch was saying, I'd be thinking to myself, that woman is definitely guilty. Lock her up. Throw her away the key. The whole time I was listening to Frisch, my heart was thumping wildly in my chest. It actually made it a bit hard to hear him for stretches of time. To my right, my husband, Sam, 
face slumped in his chair, a glassy look in his eyes. Sam was the one who hired Frisch. He's your best chance, Abby, he told me. So if he can't help me, that means I have no chance. It's all circumstantial evidence, I say, even though I'm not certain that's the case or even exactly what circumstantial evidence is, but I know one thing. I didn't do it. Frisch lets out an extended sigh and folds his arms across his chest. You have to understand that if this goes to court, you're going to be convicted. If this goes to court, I'd recommend a plea bargain when they arrest you. I imagine the police showing up at my door, snapping metal cuffs on my wrist, reading me my rights. You have the right to remain silent. Is that something they really say in real life? I don't want to find out. If they arrest me, I correct him. First gives me a look like I'm out of my mind. He's been a criminal attorney for nearly 30 years. One of the best. You can tell how successful he is by the leather sofa pushed up against the wall and the mahogany desk where he's got a photo of himself shaking the hand of Barack Obama. I've got money, but the length of a full trial might bleed us dry. Second degree murder is 15 years to life, Frisch says, whereas for murder one, you could get life without possibility of parole. If you plead down to murder two, 15 years, I cry. I don't want to go to jail for 15 years. That's a lifetime. I don't want to go to jail for one day, but 15 years is unthinkable. I can't wrap my head around it. I can't make a plea bargain that will guarantee me 15 years of prison. I can't. I look over at Sam, hoping for an equally indig indignant expression on his face. Instead, he still has that glazed look on his face. He's staring at the wall behind Frisch, and even though I'm trying to catch his eye, he won't look at me. Does he think I did it? Does my own husband really believe I'm a murderer? He knows me better than anyone else in the world, so if he believes I'm guilty, what chance do I have with the jury? But I'm not guilty. I didn't do it. I didn't kill anyone. Did I? Ah! Okay. Yep. <laughs> Brandon McFadden did it again. And then, of course, I'm also reading The uh, Quietly Hostile by Samantha Irby. This is a bunch of different essays. I am on page 64. And the next one I'm going to be reading is Body Horror. So, fun stuff. It is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 14 pages long. It's not that bad, so we'll get that out of the way. And then, I'm not sure about this one by Taylor Adams. The last word, I'm having such a difficult time. Like, I read the first chapter, and I'm just like, I don't know how to feel about this. I don't know. I'm not sure. The prologue sounds fantastic, but I think it's just the... the the writing again, the, the font. I just, I can't. Um, shoot. I don't know. <laughs> like, this one's not, it's not getting my attention like it should. Let's put it that way. Until it brings up the letters, then I'm just like, ooh, okay, letters. We love letters. But they're not love letters. I don't know. I'm just like, ah. Okay, I'll figure it out. But yeah, there's an ambitious, ambitious, ambitious TBR for this month. On top of the books that I have to do a whole different video because my boyfriend chose them except for two. So he chose four books. I chose two books. And together that's six books plus all of these library books that I just showed you. I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.